uh, Lucinda, no, no habla espanol, so no need to come on stage. Well, I'm, if you have any questions, Pablo uh, or Carolyn, they can, they can take care of you. So, Would you show your appreciation one more time for Ralph and Cindy? Thank you for that. And I do encourage you, as Larry did as well, to go out uh, in the foyer following the assembly today and talk to them and, and check out their their ministry a little further and consider supporting that uh, great work that they're doing and and uh, be, a, be a part of that as well. And, and David, thank you for sharing. It's good to see you. One of your own, you consider your own kids growing up and uh, he's kind of a man now, so I think he could take me. This past week I had an experience that, uh, it was on Thursday morning, that I, it was so impactful that I just had to tell someone about it. So as soon as that experience was over, I came to the office and I went right into Suzette's office and I, and I started to tell her about this impactful, uh, almost life-changing experience. In fact, I think the words were life-changing and Suzette can confirm that. But, it, it, but I want to tell you about it this morning. I couldn't just, just leave it uh, to sharing with Suzette, so I wanted to share it with you this morning. You see, this past Thursday, I experienced Taco Bell breakfast for the first time. I can see some of you have had that same experience. Now, I was inspired to go through the drive through on my way to work for a couple of reasons. First, because I just didn't have time to make breakfast before I left for the office. And, and, and second, because I had promised my daughters that the next day I would take them Taco Bell breakfast to where they were babysitting. And so as I promised them that, the thought of this Taco Bell breakfast, which they have spoken very highly of, it was just, it was just saturated my mind. And so I thought, well, even though I'm kind of trying to eat healthy, I'll go ahead and get the Taco Bell breakfast one time. So I pulled into the drive-thru and I ordered one of these. This is known as the AM Bacon Crunch Wrap, which is described by Taco Bell as all the classic breakfast tastes like fluffy scrambled eggs, a golden crispy hash brown, real cheddar cheese, flavorful bacon, and creamy jalapeno sauce wrapped up in a warm flour tortilla and grilled so it's good to go. Mmm. Anybody hungry? Now, I pulled up and I, offered, I, I, I ordered this, and the Taco Bell employee said, would you like to make that a meal? And I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. So, of course, I said, sure, why not? Now, I was a little confused because I thought it, a meal. You know, usually when you get a meal at Taco Bell, you get like a taco or, a, or a, uh, some nachos to go along with it. So I thought maybe I'm going to get a crunch wrap with bacon and stuff, and I'm going to have a side of nachos. And I was like, okay, whatever. But then when I, got, when I realized what had happened, when I got my bag, this is what was inside. It, was, it, it included these. Cinnabon, oh, <laughs> Cinnabon Delights, which I've made, my, made me very glad I got the meal after all because... These things, uh, here's how they describe them on the Taco Bell website. Warm, golden, bite-sized pastries filled with Cinnabon frosting and covered with Makara cinnamon sugar. Sorry, my mouth's watering a little bit here. <laughs> well, when I bit into the crunch wrap, it was, I was absolutely amazed. I was amazed. It had just the right balance of all the classic breakfast tastes, just as the website suggested. The combination of the hash brown and the bacon, it was marvelous. I mean, it was just marvelous. And the jalapeno sauce and the cheddar cheese, it was all together just very simply wonderful. It was wonderful. Then came the Cinnabon Delights. And I didn't know how to eat a Cinnabon Delight, so I, they were just about this big around, so I thought, well, I might as well just eat the whole thing. So I popped it in my mouth, and it was the best thing I could have done, I think, because they were just awesome. They were awesome. In fact, they were so great that it made me think that having dessert after breakfast is something that we should do a whole lot more. <laughs> now, chances are that you've had an experience that you've described used to someone using these words, amazed, marvelous, wonderful, awesome, great. Maybe it might have been a, a breakfast item, but it might have been a movie. It might have been a vacation. It might have been a Facebook post. It might have been a, an artistic performance by your grandchild. And if you use these words in a conversation with me to describe some event or some, something that happened to you in your life, I, it would be pretty normal. It'd be something that would be a, a kind of a normal conversation. It'd be an appropriate thing to do. But here's the problem. The same week I used 
Um, I use amazed and marvelous and wonderful to describe my bacon crunch wrap. I may come together with a bunch of believers and sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. You know, sing it with me. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner and unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And then, perhaps right after I described those Cinnabon bites as awesome and great, I might come together and worship God by singing, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works that hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. My soul, my Savior God to be, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be, how great thou art. Now, maybe this just means that we're too careless with certain words in the English language, and perhaps just as the Hebrew people even refused to speak the name of God so as to make it less holy, maybe we should save certain words only for describing God and His attributes. Or maybe we simply don't have the words powerful enough to describe God, that we kind of make do with whatever we've got, because there's not anything that we can use that would quite explain him in his fullness. But certainly we can agree that if we are describing Jesus the same way we are describing our fast food breakfast, something might be wrong. But perhaps there's an even deeper problem here, a deeper problem that we must come to grips with. It perhaps it's not our language that is deficient, but perhaps it's rather our perspective of Jesus that is deficient. You know, I was a church kid from birth. My mom took me to church. My grandma taught Sunday school early on. And every Sunday we knew we were going to church. My mom, there was no, not even a question. We always got up and we went with my mother to church. And then later on my dad joined and, and, and came to Christ and repented. And, and, and we went as a family. But, but it started with my mom. And all through my life I was a church kid. And so, being a church kid, I grew up in the 80s knowing uh, what Jesus was. I had a, a clear vision of, of Jesus, and it was affected being a church kid by a couple of things. First of all, it was affected by the pictures of Jesus that I saw in my church building. There were pictures of, of, of Jesus. You've maybe seen some of these, like this picture of, of Jesus. It almost looks like Jesus' senior picture, you know, <laughs> that he was taking his senior picture, and this is the one that was in his yearbook. And, you know, it's this nice, uh, very noble-looking beard, Jesus. And sometimes the sash was not red. It was blue, right? You know, that, I think that was Jesus' favorite color. That's what they say. And so you had this picture. It was up on the wall somewhere, maybe in a, in a Sunday school classroom. Then, of course, you had Jesus interacting with different things. And there was Jesus interacting with the children. That was usually in the nursery, right? Or, or in the elementary classroom, that Jesus loves the little children. So you had a picture of Jesus with the children. And then usually at every church I went to when I was growing up, there was always a picture of Jesus holding a lamb. He was, he was holding a sheep. And these are kind of the, the, the pictures that influenced the way I thought about Jesus, the, the, the vision I had about Jesus. Not only that, but, but every Sunday school room, of course, being a child of the 80s, every Sunday school room that I had growing up always had a, in the corner a piece of wood covered in blue flannel, right? The flannel graph, the flannel board. 
And so then the teachers would do something like this where they'd have this flannel graph Jesus that they would put up on there and they'd have the different parts of the story. That's how they'd tell a Bible story. And so that's how I learned. That was my vision of Jesus. And so my perspective of Jesus, it was this sweet, mild-mannered, smiling, and kind-looking man with long hair and blue eyes who liked children and livestock. He was a good guy. He was a nice guy. Now, being that I was a kid of the 80s, I also had a variety of movies that I either saw or heard of that gave me a perspective of what a manly man was. Some of my favorites is uh, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford with his Indiana Jones character. You have Indiana Jones, and he's got, he could do anything with that whip, and he was a manly man. And, of course, his other main character that, that he's known for, he was Han Solo. He was the kind of man that when Princess Leia kissed him and she said, I love you, he said, I know. <laughs> I mean, how manly is that, right? And then after that, there was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Man, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a manly man. He, he was in the Terminator, I'll be back, right? That, the, the manly man, uh, kind of action hero. And then, of course, there was, he was the hero in the, the movie Predator. And he, he would show that picture there, the picture of him in Predator. And he had the, the machine gun and the big and the other guns, right? And he was, he was a manly man. Of course, then there was this movie, and it ruined it all. Kindergarten Cop just kind of <laughs> ruined it all. But perhaps my favorite was Sylvester Stallone. I love Sylvester Stallone because I love the Rocky movies. You know, he beat the he beat he, he turned communist on its communism on its ear by beating beating uh, uh, Drago. You know, and he's got the, he's really tough, the, the the tough kid from Philadelphia. And then, of course, maybe the epitome of the tough man in the '80s action hero Rambo. Rambo, was there any tougher action hero? than Rambo. And so if you would have asked me to name some of the strongest, fiercest, most powerful men, I probably would have said men like Harrison Ford. I would have said uh, maybe Clint Eastwood or Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or Sylvester Stallone, but I probably would not have included Jesus in that list. Probably wouldn't have been on my radar. It wasn't that I thought Jesus lacked power, I knew he had power to do miracles. I knew he walked on water. I knew he calmed the storm. I knew he conquered death. I knew all those things, but in my mind, he was a lot more like Mr. Rogers than he was like Rambo. Well, maybe that's because I wasn't very familiar with today's passage. If you haven't already, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. You see, there are consequences for underestimating Jesus. There are consequences for underestimating Jesus. There are consequences for Je- seeing Jesus as gentle and harmless, as seeing him as Mr. Rogers instead of Rambo. There are consequences of declawing the Lion of Judah and effectively reducing him into a house cat. There are consequences for having a diminished view of the Messiah. And as uh, Matt Proctor explained, it's not that we don't think about Jesus, it's that we don't think big enough about Jesus. And you know what happens when you have a diminished view of Jesus? Do you know what happens when your view of Jesus is just too small? Well, what happens is you get churches like we read about in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Revelation, of course, was written by the Apostle John about A.D. 95. And John is an old man. He's a prisoner of his faith. He's in exile on the island of Patmos. And in verse 10, John writes that it was Sunday, and he was worshiping. And he is in the Spirit when all of a sudden a rumbling, loud voice speaks to him. And then in verse 11, the voice says this. It says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, or Thyatira to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you skip ahead to chapters 2 and 3, which we're going to cover next week, but if you skip ahead, what you find is these churches all had something in common, is that they all had a diminished underestimated view of Jesus. Simply put, their Jesus was too small. Now there are two diminished views of Jesus that will cause problems for us as believers and will cause problems for us as a church. And the first one is the domesticated Jesus. The domesticated Jesus. And when we look at these churches in Revelation, we see that many of them were overwhelmed by the problems of the world and many of them were mired in their sin. 
The church of Ephesus had lost their first love. Pergamum is full of false teaching. Thyatira is full of idol worship and sexual immorality. Sardis is full of hypocrisy, and Laodicea is lukewarm. And these churches had some pretty serious problems, and it's evidenced by Jesus' warning to them, uh, how serious his warning was. And what brought them to this state of crisis? What brought them to this point where Jesus had to call them out and call them to repentance? Well, I believe it's because they lost sight of Jesus. They lost sight of who Jesus was. That they became too familiar with Jesus. He was too familiar to them. He was too domesticated. They have lost sight of who he really was. And a deficient view of Jesus will always result in a deficient church. Because when you see Jesus as Mr. Rogers, as a buddy, as a therapist, when you declaw the Lion of Judah and turn him into a house cat, then what is to stop you from doing whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it? Wilbur Rees wrote a poem. Maybe you've heard it. It's called The $3 Worth of God. He wrote, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or pick beets with a migrant. I don't want ecstasy, not transformation. I want warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. When we turn Jesus into a domesticated Jesus, we are essentially saying, you know, $3 worth is just about right. That's all I need. That's all I really want. And Jesus, knowing that some of these churches were facing the consequences of a domesticated view of him, he decides that he's going to fix that in Revelation chapter 1. Starting with verse 12. John writes, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. And, and we know that, the, son, or that the, the seven lampstands represented the seven churches, and we see that this uh, son of man was Jesus, and Jesus was among the churches. That means he was not distant. He was not far away in heaven somewhere. He is not the man upstairs. He is right there in the midst of of the churches in the midst of his people, fulfilling the promise he made in Matthew chapter 28, where he said, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We read among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. And part of this outfit is the priestly garment, but more importantly, it was the dress of a king. That Jesus had cast off his uh, clothes of poverty that he had worn while he was on this earth before he died on the cross and was resurrected. And he had taken on his, the clothing that really revealed who he truly was, the king, the king of the universe. Verse 14, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And this was not the hair of, that some of us are starting to get or maybe have gotten or maybe even have lost at this point. This is not the hair of old age and maturity or, or anything of that nature. This was the, the hair that represented uh, honor and dignity and respect and wisdom. And it says his eyes were like blazing fire. These eyes, they're piercing. They pierce through our hypocrisy. They, they pierce through the walls we put up. They pierce through the church faces we put on and this facade of fake purity that we put on into, this, into the reality of our heart and our souls. Verse 5 says his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And this gave the idea that Jesus was stable. He was immovable. He was firm. He would not stumble. He would not falter. He would stand strong. And it says his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his hand, he held seven stars. You ever been in this building before when the rain comes down hard? You got to turn up the sound system a little bit if I'm preaching because it's hard to hear. Have you ever stood next to a raging river or a waterfall like Niagara Falls? What a powerful force. Did you watch videos of the flooding in Beaumont earlier this week? What a powerful force. What a powerful sound. An overwhelming noise. This is the sound of his voice. And, and while we learn that the stars that he held in his hand, they represent the churches, the, uh, the churches, the angels, the messengers of the churches, consider the mightiness of one that can hold. You know, we used to sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. But consider that he's holding solar systems, multiple solar systems in his hands. And that he's got the whole world in his hands as the song goes, but he's powerful enough just to flick our planet into another part of the universe if he so desires. 
Then it says, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Church, this is not flannel graph Jesus. This is not Mr. Rogers Jesus. This is, is not hippie therapist Jesus. This is the Jesus of John 1 where we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. This is the eternal Jesus that was there before the foundations of the world, that through Him, nothing was, without Him, nothing was made. This is the Jesus of Genesis 1 who simply spoke, and out of nothing came things like the oceans and the Rocky Mountains and the Grand Canyon in the entire universe simply by uttering a a few syllables. I must confess to you that there's a certain type of prayer I don't pray as often as I should or as often as I used to. I used to pray things like, Lord Jesus, just make us aware of your presence. Or, Lord Jesus, just fill us with your power. I don't pray that as often anymore because I'm scared. What if he really answered that prayer with a, okay, here you go. Can you imagine if he truly filled this place with his presence? Now, I'm not saying I shouldn't pray that. I'm not saying I shouldn't desire that. But I'm telling you, that's a scary thought. Because frankly, I'm scared that if he makes that so, can you imagine what that would be like? And when the Apostle John came into the presence of this Jesus, look what happened in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now remember, this is the Apostle John who reclined at the chest of Jesus during the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. This is the disciple who identified himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the disciple who spent day in and day out with Jesus over a period of three or so years. This is the disciple who knew Jesus, yet when he encountered the glorified Christ in the fullness of who he is, he fell before him trembling, fell on his face as if he were dead, terrified of what he saw. You see, there is no casual posture in the presence of Jesus. There is no voluntary act of humility or reverence. No, in the presence of Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And this is the undomesticated Jesus who walks among the churches in Revelation. And because the number seven, as we're going to talk about, it represents completion and perfection, we can be sure that it is the same Jesus who walks in the midst of God's people today. And John's warning is very clear to that, those churches and to us. His warning is very clear. It's simply, Jesus is watching. He's not somebody who will wink us and nudge us about our sin. He's not this impotent parent who dismisses our sin by just saying, oh, kids will be kids. This is the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the omniscient king of the universe, and he is not to be mocked. He is not to be trifled with. He is among us, and He knows our sin, and He is big enough to do something about it. Now, this is not about salvation. This is about discipline. It's not about eternity, but it is about consequences. It's not about trying to make Christ love us more, but it is about understanding how Christ feels about sin. And so this morning, if there is a sin that we are hiding, if there's a sin, something we are harboring, something we are guarding, protecting, and holding on to, we must be aware. We must be aware. Maybe it's a grudge, an attitude of bitterness or anger or hatred that we, have just, we just cling to. Maybe it's a pattern of lustful thoughts and actions that we secretly feed and we stash it away for whenever that urge arrives. Maybe it's an attitude of general selfishness that, that influences everything we do and makes everything we do about us. Maybe it, it's that we made an idol out of a job or a bank account or a family or a human relationship. Maybe it's a whole batch of mixed up priorities that have placed our own kingdom work above where the work of God belongs in our lives. But whatever it may be, if we are harboring and hiding sin, we must be aware that this undomesticated Jesus is demanding our repentance. He's demanding our repentance. Six times in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus tells the churches to repent. When Jesus says, 
I'm standing outside the door knocking. He's not talking to the unbeliever. He is talking to the church. If you look through your Bible, for every one time that an unbeliever is called to repent, seven times believers are called to repent. Christ calls us to repentance. We must open our eyes and see Christ as he is and allow the fullness of his lordship eradicate everything that hinders our lives and everything that hinders our church. But as we read about the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we see another diminished view of Jesus. We see the, the, the domesticated Jesus, but we also see the dormant Jesus as well. Now, we certainly see churches in Revelation that Jesus is calling to repentance, but there's another crisis that we see there. You see, some of the churches that are in Revelation 2 and 3, they were obedient. In the midst of evil and persecution, they were taking an absolute beating for their obedience. See, the Roman emperor at the time was Domitian, and, and the Christian persecution, it was the national policy of Rome. And, and the best example I can give to, to talk about how, uh, how horrible this persecution was is that, they, that the emperor would go out and find Christians, and what he would do is he would have garden parties in, his, in Roman gardens all across the, the, the empire, and what he would do is he'd take these Christians and he'd cover them with tar while they were still alive, burying them up to their necks, and they would light their heads on fire while they were still alive to light up their gardens. This is not just some sort of, oh, people make fun of you because you're a Christian thing. This is serious, hardcore, hardship and persecution. And we see that this is what was happening to some of these churches in the letters. That Ephesus had endured hardship, that Smyrna had been slandered and some had been thrown in prison. And that one of the men from the church in Pergamum had already been martyred. And all of these things were done for the name of Christ. And, and all of these are not minor inconveniences, but they are life-changing and life-threatening forms of persecution. You can bet, you can believe that these churches, that the people in these churches were scared. There's no question. When you're facing persecution on behalf of Christ, then it's absolutely vital that your view of him is not diminished. And it seems that some of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 were suffering the consequences of a diminished view of Jesus, a dormant view of Jesus. And let me explain what I mean by that. In the movie Braveheart, the main character, William Wallace, is fighting against the tyranny of England for Scotland to gain freedom for, for the Scottish people. And, and he and his uh, band of, of, of uh, commoners are taking on uh, England's army. And so he knows, though, at some point that the only way that Scotland can truly gain their freedom is that if the commoners and the nobles join together forces and go after and fight uh, England and, and the king uh, together. And so for a while there, he kind of gains the support of, of the uh, noble men, and they, they kind of help him out here and there and do different things. But then there comes a crucial battle. And the plan was this, that Wallace and his men were going to go out to the middle of the battlefield, and they were going to go out, and they were going to start fighting. And just at the right moment, Wallace was going to signal, and the noble men were supposed to ride in. They were the cavalry. They were supposed to ride in on their horses and help secure the field, help secure the victory. In the movie, we see Wallace picks up the flag and makes the this, makes this signal, and you see the nobleman up on the, on the horizon, and they look at each other, and they look at each other, and they just, they just ride away. They're not willing to fight. They're not willing to come to the aid of the commoners. And so the peasant army was then defeated by the English, and Wallace was captured and killed. And You see, a, a diminished view of Jesus it causes us to forget his power and his promises. And we start thinking that, that Jesus is kind of like those noblemen up on the, up on the ridge. That, that, you know, maybe he, he's kind of said he'll help us out, he'll protect us, he'll be there in, with us in battle. But then when it comes to the, to the hard times, we're not really sure that he's going to be there. We're not really sure he's willing to, to help us succeed. And maybe instead of coming in and riding into the battle, he'll just turn around and ride away. And so... What happens is that when we believe we're on our own in our own battles, when we forget his power and his promises, Jesus is dormant and either he's unwilling or unable to help us succeed and, and, and back us up. And what happens is we become paralyzed by our fear because we know we can't do it by ourselves. We know there's no use going at it alone. And this dormant view of Jesus, it caused the churches in Revelation to be paralyzed by fear. And maybe it was the fear of persecution Maybe it was the fear of failure, but the fear caused by the misconception of a dormant Jesus led to inaction 
in obedience, and it led to inaction and mission. And once again, Jesus says the same thing about sin. He calls them to repent, to align their wishes and their wills and their actions with God's desires for them. And while we may not be facing physical persecution in our lives, we certainly encounter fear of many kinds that keeps us from realizing God's intentions for us as individual believers and as a church. We struggle with the fear of failure. We don't have what it takes to go out and do what God has called us to do. We, we struggle with the fear of discomfort, that I kind of like my life the way it is. And if I have to go and do what God has called me to do, it may require change. I don't like that idea. Maybe it's the fear of danger. When I start coming in contact with messy people, then I'm going to start having some mess spill over on me. And maybe there's some danger involved in reaching people for Christ. And, and, and certainly, perhaps maybe the biggest fear is this fear of life change. As I said before, that I like how it is now, and, and I just want to kind of stay the course and, and do my family thing and do my job thing and do my life thing and, and, and all that. And, and God comes in and He says, wait a second, this is my life. And so we fear this life change. And, and so that's why we need to hear what John heard in Revelation chapter 1. You see, John is faced down before the mighty, undomesticated Christ. He's overcome with fear and humility in the presence of the glorified Jesus. And Jesus puts his hand on John's shoulder and he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. You see, when we have a diminished view of Jesus, when we see him as dormant, then again, fear has a tendency to take over our lives. But when we see Jesus as he is, we soon realize that he is more powerful than any and every problem that we may encounter. He is the first and last. That means he is eternal. He was dead and he is alive. That means our sin, he's got that taken care of. He holds the keys to death and Hades. Not even death is a problem for those who are in Christ. And if death is not a problem, I got to tell you, nothing in life is going to be a problem either. Reminds me of Matthew chapter 14. You probably remember the story that Jesus had miraculously fed thousands of people and he sent his disciples off onto the, to the lake by themselves and he went off to pray and, and while they were out there, a storm came in and the wind and the waves were buffeting against the boat and it says Jesus looked from a far away off and they were struggling against the oars. They were struggling for their life. And, and so uh, and Jesus certainly knew what he was doing when he sent them out there, by the way. And they're out there just, just struggling, trying to keep the, the boat from being capsized and from dying. And, and all of a sudden, as they look out there in the wind and the waves, they see what they thought was a ghost because they'd never seen anything quite like this before. But it was Jesus walking out on the water to them. Now, I believe that the point of that story was that God was establishing the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God, that only God could, be, could do this. But I believe also that Jesus walked out on the, onto the water, this water that was threatening their lives, this water that was certainly causing fear and anguish in the disciples, causing them to, to be scared for their lives. And Jesus was showing that he'll take the biggest of our fears, the biggest of our concerns, and he will turn it into a step stool for his glory. He'll take the things that, that, that freak us out and he'll just walk all over. He'll use it to be glorified, use it to show us his glory in his power in our lives. Church, our Lord is not dormant. He is powerful. He is mighty. He is huge. And again, our language is insufficient. I don't have the words to describe his fullness. And in Jesus, in his fullness of power and glory, he still, this is the great thing about it, he still puts his hand on our shoulder and says, do not be afraid. It's not that he promised that he would make it easier. He didn't say, do not be afraid, John. I'm going to go ahead and get you off this island. He didn't say that. He's not going to make it any easier. It's not that he promised that he would make it safe. He didn't say, send this to the churches and tell them that all the persecution is going to end and we're going to live happily ever after. That's not what he said. He didn't promise any of those things, but he did promise that he is not dormant, that he is active and he is present. And when we see Jesus as he truly is, that is all that should really matter. You see, this is the message of Revelation. This is the message of Revelation, that it's tough now. 
It's difficult now. It's challenging now. It's not fair now. There's hunger now. There's hurt now. There's pain now. There's death now. There's struggle now. There's all of these things now. But in the end, this, the Savior we just read about, this glorified Christ, this is the Savior we serve. And guess what? In the end, God wins. The book of Revelation, it's not a crystal ball about dates and predictions. Instead, it is a megaphone proclaiming the ultimate victory of God and his people. We're going to see that Revelation, it was not written to reveal secret dates on a calendar, but to encourage weary and struggling Jesus followers. That Revelation was not written so that we can make charts and try to figure out what this means exactly and that means exactly, but so that we can make choices, choices that lead both to both holiness and hope in our lives. I love what Mark Moore wrote about Revelation in his book. This is what he wrote. He said, Revelation is often approached as a calendar. Some look at it as a history book that describes the Roman persecution of the first century. Others believe it tells primary, primarily of yet future events. Both try to pin each symbol to a date on the calendar. That creates a problem, however, if this book is primarily about the past. It's not very motivating for us today. If it's primarily about the present, then it was largely irrelevant to John's original audience. Either way, most Christians throughout history of the church who have applied Revelation to themselves have been mostly wrong. But what if Revelation is not viewed as a calendar, but as a template? What if we're able to lay its principles over any period of suffering? That's not to say that John did not have a historical reality in mind when he wrote the book. It is to say, however, that like the prophecies of the Old Testament, there are principles and metaphors embedded in them that are contemporary and relevant for each generation. That's why this book has perpetual relevance. And this is what I love what he said. He said, wherever there is tragedy or suffering, put this on the screen, please. Wherever there is tragedy or suffering, persecuted Christians or rampant evil, this book weaves its way into the life of the church, reminding God's people of their security in Christ, the seriousness of spiritual warfare, and the wondrous sovereignty of our mighty God. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I live in a time of rampant evil where we see planes being shot down and schools being shot in. And the battle of evil that I face each and every day in my heart. And I can tell you that if I'm doing my life right, and if you're doing your life right, and if we are a church that's doing what we're supposed to be, we will encounter persecution. Boy, I pray that we become a church of persecution. We are persecuted for our faith. But the Christ we serve, he is not domesticated and he is not dormant. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the judge of all creation. He is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He is the living one. He was dead and he is now alive forever and ever. He holds the keys to death and Hades and he is our Let's pray. God, our words, our applause, our songs, our lives are not enough. They're not enough to show your power, your majesty, your grace, your love, your wisdom. And we thank you for that, God. God, we do not want a Savior that we can domesticate. We do, want, do not want a Savior that is dormant. We want a Savior that is mighty and powerful and sees us and is with us, is amongst us, and, and has taken care of our sin, but yet demands that we live in a way that glorifies Him and that sees our inaction and our, and our fear, but puts, our hand, puts his, your, your hand on our shoulder and says, do not be afraid because you are with us always. And God, in the face of the evil and the, and, and, the, and the fear that we will face as we pursue a life that's meant to glorify you and to be a church that is all you called us to be, we just pray that you will continually remind us of the reality of who your son is. God, we just pray that, that the reality of that Christ, the mighty risen Savior, permeate through this congregation in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. 
And God, as we study this book, I pray that you'll just give us clear minds to see that it's not a a, a treasure map or a crossword puzzle as much as it is a template to look to see that, yeah, things are tough. Yeah, there, there's struggles. Yeah, there's suffering. But you are in charge and you have won. And that should give us hope. That should give us peace. That should give us boldness as we proclaim you to the nations. So God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we do it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Let's stand as we sing.